Hey, it's Zach, and there's a new podcast I want to tell you about. 30 for 30 podcasts. Our old friends present March 11th, 2020, a standalone audio documentary that tells the story of the day the NBA shut down and the pandemic became real for many Americans. It's told by those who lived the events of that day and built entirely with archival and exclusive interviews, including Rudy Gobert and Dr. Anthony Fauci. March 11th, 2020, will tell the story of a day that started in one reality and ended in a new one. 30 for 30 podcast presents March 11th, 2020. Subscribe and listen now wherever you get your podcasts. The Low Post is brought to you by Goodyear, helping you discover the road ahead. Goodyear, more driven. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post podcast, where it's Tuesday, December 22nd, and the NBA season is starting. That's a thing that's happening somehow. I think the Lakers won the championship about 10 days ago. But the new season must go on. Knock on wood, everyone stays healthy and all of that. And to help us preview it as part of what has become an annual tradition, the one and only one of the voices of the NBA, a great coach for many years, Jeff Van Gundy. How are you? Doing fine. How are you, Zach? I'm good. Can you believe this? You must feel like you were in the, in the bubble like yesterday. Yeah, I tell you what, I, uh, I never felt as safe as I felt in the bubble, and I was never so happy to get out of safety and drive <laughs> home. So, yeah, just happened. What's the drive from Orlando to Houston? It was 17, 17 hours, Ooh. I think. Yeah. So you got to stop. You got to have an overnight somewhere. No, no, straight through. Both wow. ways. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It was good, though. It wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't hit any traffic, and, uh, you know, the coming back, remember the hurricane had just struck Louisiana again. And uh, so I had to drive through and you see on the highway, all the trees down. Now it's to the side, but there was so much traffic coming back into Louisiana from uh, Texas, you know, um, but not much traffic for me. So it was good. Are you are you a grab and go and eat while you drive or will you stop and sit and eat? Uh even in the best of times, I would never think went on a road trip to stop, sit and eat. I'm, I'm like you. I'm like, let's let's get there. Give me the, I, I got to go pee. Give me a sandwich. I'll eat yeah. in the car. Yeah. You know, fast food. That's what it was made for. So, you know, now the thing you have to as you get older is how much caffeine you intake, because that, you know, now you have to go to the bathroom more, which slows you down. But if you don't drink enough caffeine, then you can't stay as alert and awake. So it's a, it's a whole process when you get to be as ancient as I am. The people who are like, I want to stop and take a walk and stretch my legs for 45 minutes. I'm like, what are, what are we doing? We have a 12 hour drive. Let's go. Let's make it happen. Yes. And, and you definitely want to start. I left the bubble. I forgot what time the game ended, but I left the hotel at like four 30 in the morning and People always ask me, don't you want some company? You want to listen to a, no uh, insult intended. Do you want to listen to a podcast? I said, no, I want to drive in silence. The radio, <laughs> the radio was on like maybe 12 minutes out of the 17 hours. It's a great place for conversation or just deep thought. You know, so it was interesting. Like on the way back, the best part of it was I was a part of an interview process and they had their team psychologist talk to me on the phone. So I had a two-hour therapy session on the way back. Uh, it was great. I loved See, it. If I were that team psychologist, I would have asked you, are you listening to anything in the car? Are you, do, is there a podcast? And if you had said to me, I prefer 17 hours of dead silence, I would have been like, we got we to gotta, we gotta go in a different direction here. This I, isn't going to work out. Maybe, maybe that's what happened. You never know. <laughs> yeah. But okay. I was good about having a therapy session it was awesome, you know. So it was good. All right. Well, I hope you solve some issues, and let's solve some issues about the NBA season coming up. Yesterday, I posted my annual column where I break the teams into tiers. I like tiers instead of power rankings because I like to try to group teams and differentiate, like who do I think is a real contender. And who do I think is like uh, nine things have to go perfect for this team to be a contender? And I sent it to you and I said, don't bother reading this because you're way too smart. You won't learn anything. Just look at the tiers. Tell me what you agree and disagree with and we'll riff about that. So let's start at the top. You only told me a little bit, which I like. You didn't spoil a lot of the content. Let's start at the very top. 
I have the Lakers in their own tier as undisputed favorites. Nobody deserves to enter the season in a tier with them. Maybe by the end, somebody like Milwaukee or the Clippers proves worthy of it, but not now. You indicated that you disagree. You don't have the Lakers by themselves. You're not as high, I guess, on the Lakers. Tell me why. It's not, it's not not being high on the Lakers. Obviously, they're a great team. I think they, personnel-wise, I think everybody would assume they got better. Um, but I think you have to throw Milwaukee in there because not only have they had a run of sustained consistency in the regular season, I think they got better with Holiday, which is, a uh, to me, a superior – now they have a superior – wing defender, um, which I think matters in the playoffs, and particularly if they get to the finals against James. So I would throw Milwaukee in there, not because L.A. has dropped, but I think Milwaukee is better equipped to win in the playoffs. I agree with you they're better equipped to win in the playoffs. I think a lot of people are focusing on, well, their depth isn't as good. I don't know if I trust DJ Augustine or Bobby Portis to play crunch time in the conference finals or whatever. And I, I get that. I'm just like, I've, I've, the Milwaukee has done the depth thing enough. I want to see, like, give me the elite playoff lineup that you can close games with where you trust all five guys on offense and on defense. And one of those five guys can handle the ball so Giannis doesn't have to do everything and just run into brick walls. And Holiday gives me a third guy along with Middleton and Giannis that I know I can trust both ends of the floor. Not sure I trust his pull-up shooting when he runs pick and roll with Giannis, which I, I, I'd i be curious to hear what your thoughts are. I think that has to be an important part of their offense, Giannis' screener. I think they should lean into that a little bit more because, again, it, it takes you away from the brick wall thing. I don't know who the other two spots in that lineup are, but I, I agree with you. Holiday, look, they gave up the farm for him. They botched the Bogdanovich thing, didn't get him. But their playoff equity is higher to me with another elite two-way player. All the other stuff is noise. They have another elite two-way player. That's what matters. Yeah, and I think the, I think depth is really important in the regular season. I think it's less important in the postseason. I think the quality of your player – don't tell me how good your 11th best player is in the playoffs. You know, your top eight are going to – you're going to live and die with them. And I, I really like them. And I know, you know, because they ended up not advancing last year to where they wanted to, uh, people have questions. And you're right. I think they – I don't look at that trade with New Orleans as um, Bledsoe for Holiday. I, I look at it as much as uh, Giannis – was a part of that trade sure. because, you know, I don't know if he would have stayed no matter what. I think, you know, who knows? I don't know him, but I think they did what they felt was necessary to give them their best chance to re-sign him. And so I think uh, they did the right thing, obviously. And I think they're a championship caliber team and I think they have great coaching and, you know, I think they're, they clearly deserve to be in that upper echelon. I do think Bud is going to coach the regular season more with the playoffs in mind. And you're a coach, so you can get into this much more sophisticated than I can. The knock on Bud, which I think is, is fair, is that they play one way in the regular season, particularly on defense. This is how we play. We don't switch. We drop back. And when they get in and they play it all 82 games or this season, what are we playing? 72. Um, and then they get into the playoffs and they find a team that – that style doesn't really work very well against. They have great pull-up three-point shooters, whatever. They have off-ball action like Miami has, which you have to switch a lot of that or else you're dead. And they can't adjust in time to save the series. And I think Bud is going to coach this regular season, similar to the depth thing. Like, we've done the depth thing. We don't care. I think he's going to coach this regular season, I'm curious anyway, with more of an eye on being adaptable, like, right away. First quarter, we're already changing up the scheme we play. We're already making – not necessarily like an overhaul because you can't overhaul, but little adjustments. And that's one of the things – like when I watch the Bucks night to night, that's one of the things I'm curious about because Drew Holiday is not just an elite defender. He's a very, very switchable defender, and that's not something they've done as much as like a lot of other teams. 
and they've led the league in defense. So I think that's true. I think you have to be, you always self-evaluate as a coach. And sometimes the reasons you come for, for your failings in a playoff series is much different than what, you know, the outside world determines why you lost. And so I think you have to be very clear headed in your evaluation. Did we lose because of scheme or did we lose because of uh, lack of execution, uh, missed open shots? Like all those things, you know, I, I hear the critiques after a playoff series and what everybody ha- should have done. Uh, but if you're constantly changing, you may not be good at anything. And so I think there is a fine line between being adaptable and versatile enough and then the outside world thinking that switching is the panacea to all great defense, which truly, when you look at the top defensive teams, not one is like the teams that always switch. Like you look at Toronto, why are they good defensively? They scramble, they rotate hard, they close hard, but they, they help. They, like Same with Milwaukee. They take away the paint first. These teams that are caught in no man's land where they take away nothing, those are the teams that you worry about. Like people say, you got to take away the three. Well, guess what? It's really hard to take away the basket, take away free throws, and take away the three. And what you see Milwaukee was vulnerable to, even in the first round against Orlando, you know, Vucevic hurt him with the pick and pop three. You know, they win game one. And so, like, again, when you're, st- when you're Mike Budenholzer, you're so smart. You've won at such a high level in both Atlanta and Milwaukee. I think you have to drill down to what exactly your thinking is on why you weren't as successful. And I guarantee it's probably not the same as what some outside voices uh, believe your downfall was. And to your point, I had a very smart person in the league who works for a, a team that is not involved in any of these playoff series. Um one of the things he did during all the downtime that we had was he went back and watched the Bucks Raptors conference finals from 2019 and the conclusion that he came with. And it's so funny when you watch these series years later, you're, you're just watching it with much clearer eyes. You're not worried about what the story is. What am I going to write? What are the adjustments? It's, it's, it's much clearer to you. And his takeaway was the Bucks lost in part because they adjusted too much that they were better. He said, I was surprised that to see this two years later or a year later, whatever it is, when they stuck with their base scheme, with some exceptions here or there, they were actually more successful than when they sort of panicked and switched it up and Toronto really hurt them. And I, I, I would like to do that exercise someday myself because I also think that, look, they lost four straight games. And did you do that series? You did, We did the East that year, right? Um, no, I think, I don't think so. I don't remember. I don't remember. But they lost four games in a row, and that stings. But they were also up 2-0. Game three was a double overtime game, and Toronto ended up winning the championship. They're a championship-level team. It's a great team. Last year's loss in the bubble is one thing. It was disheartening. They got rolled. They were getting rolled before Giannis turned his ankle in the second round to a team that matched up well against them but was not at that time considered a threat to win the championship. The Toronto loss, I think, has gotten overblown because of the four straight defeats. That That is not a loss that really alarms me, other than the biggest question for them is their half-court offense has failed against elite defenses in the playoffs, and that's what undid them against the Raptors. More than their own defense, more than the schemes, if you look at the numbers, they could not score in the half-court against that defense that you talked about that flies in and flies out like the Raptors do. And And – you know, I think that's where Holiday can hopefully help them. I just, I guess I just kind of need to see it. Like, I think Drew's a good offensive player, not really a great one. And I, I just think the Lakers, I loved what they did in the offseason. It sounds like you did too. Yeah. Well, going back to the Bucks, though, we always talk about the star player. What do we have to do to surround him, to make it easier for him to, you know, to, to sign him? Here, the bottom line of their half court offense is, Giannis has to be better. Like he has to be better. And yeah, so does everybody else. I'm not trying to take away responsibility from any other player, but 
if you're going to get 90% of the credit, then you have to take your fair share of uh, the responsibility. And so in the low post, what can he count on? Um, I, I think one thing that – I think they won so easily last year in the regular season that their shot selection at times uh, – the dribble up three by Giannis, right? So I always look at shot selection like, yeah, that's fine up 22 in the third at home against a, a bad team. But what if, are, are we going to take those same shots, uh, tie game, eight minutes to go in the fourth? You know, the dribble up three by uh, a mediocre three-point shooter. And I think you want to give him – the room to expand his game. And at the same time, I think a player has to be uh, sound enough, smart enough to know in a playoff series, what's good for him and what's not good for him and the team. And so I think that whole shot selection, how, you know, how are they going to generate shots in the half court is very interesting. And I think a lot of it comes down to Giannis needs to be better. Well, and you've been on this from the beginning I was seduced by the idea of Giannis as three-point shooter. I was seduced by, well, if he ever, if he ever can make threes, it's, it's over. They're going to have to press him out there. And I was wrong, and you were right, because no one is ever guarding him there. It's never going to change. He's never going to get guarded there. And what he really needed to work on was post-game, floater or pull-up, and free throw shooting and his free throw shooting has collapsed in the playoffs every single year compared to the regular season. And I'm, and I was wrong and you were right. Like the post game needs to be better because that's a way where he can serve as a passer and a fulcrum. And, and I think the reads for him are a little more direct there when the double comes than they are when everything is in flux around him. And uh, just give me the pull up two. I mean, that's a hard shot. People are like, Oh, he just needs to add a, a pull up too. I mean, Ask, ask Kawhi and KD how hard they had to work to hone that shot off the dribble, pull up, face up too. That's a really hard shot against great defenses, but a floater, a jump hook, something. I mean, that's what I want to see. And, and you've been right. You, you've been right. And I, w- I was incorrectly seduced by make him a three point shooter. And that solves everything. Well, listen, if he can make threes at a high rate um, or even an average rate, then it's probably, it's a great thing for him, but like you said, defensively, no matter what rate he shoots him at, you're not closing any harder or trying to like, you're not going to force him to be a driver. There he is absolutely elite. It's the same thing with Ben Simmons, you know, the consternation about him and his shooting or not shooting. It's not going to change how he's ever guarded. Like he could make a three and you're still closing, you know, two steps short. And it's the same thing with uh, Giannis. It's, it's just because you can't take away everything, you know, that elite first step, the length, the whole thing. And it's the same when he goes to his left to right spin. I don't care how much shooting you put around him. That next defender is going to be there on the spin against good defensive teams because, you know, if you're not there, he'll be shooting layups, drawing fouls. So, um, you know, these are things that, as you say, get analyzed much harsher in the playoffs under the glare of one possession or one quarter making the difference between being deemed successful and unsuccessful. And that's why the regular season, you know, when you win as easily as Milwaukee won last year and the year before that, I don't think it necessarily hardens you to what you're going to face in the playoffs. Well, and the irony of, of what you're talking about with the honest and threes is the Bucks defense is based in part on the idea of, if we leave a 35% three-point shooter open, like an okay three-point shooter open from above the break, and he misses, and then he misses again, he's not going to shoot again because he's going to be mentally rattled. He's going to feel like he's been selfish. And that's what teams are going to do to the Bucs. And Giannis, even if he shoots 35% from three, they're just going to leave him open because they know he's not going to shoot it every time. Even if the math says that shot every single time, a hundred times per game is, oh, that's optimal. That's the analytics and blah, blah, blah. Like they're not going to shoot it. And the Bucks defense is based on that same idea. If we leave Miles Turner open 10 times in a row, the math says he should keep shooting. He's not. And their offense is going to stall out and we're going to break them mentally.
All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, before we get to some other teams we disagree on, we did not hit on either of those teams, uh, either of these teams that I want your opinion on. First, where are you on the Clippers after having watched them self-destruct against the Nuggets? And, and, but, and I should phrase it the other way too. After watching the Nuggets destroy them three games in a row in the bubble, um, they sign Serge Ibaka, they lose to Michael Green. Uh, they lose Matres Harrell, obviously. Where are you on the Clippers, who were my pick to win the title last year? I think you were also very high on them. Uh, what's your temperature take right now? I'm very high on them. I think they're an outstanding team. I think, you know, I think you from the bubble, uh, there are going to be some teams that are overrated because of how they perform there, and there's going to be some teams that are underrated. And I think you have to be very careful uh, if you're a team in analyze your, analyzing your team either too harshly or too positively by what happened in those unusual circumstances. I thought Denver did a terrific job coming back 3-1 to Utah, 3-1 to the Clippers. And obviously, the Clippers have taken a lot uh, more grief for them losing the 3-1 lead than Utah did. But I think when you're both Utah and the Clippers – you acknowledge one that Denver's a really good team and two, we can do better. And I think um, Utah uh, has Bogdanovich back, you know, got favors back. So they know what they've addressed. I think the Clippers are a little bit more. um, It's a little bit harder to determine exactly where they're at because I love, I liked Michael green a lot uh, as a role player. Um, And Ibaka, I think, is very good. But Harrell, I think, again, is being judged so harshly on what happened in the postseason. And some people may forget how effective he was in the regular season. So uh, I'm very high in the Clippers. I think the Clippers had the best roster last year. It didn't work for them um, in the playoffs. But I think they come back as a championship caliber team. And I would be very, very surprised if they're not either in the Western Conference Finals or the Finals. Uh, Look, I mean, I I was right there with you. I thought they had the best roster in the league last year. Um, I love the Abaca addition for them. It's just a dimension they didn't have. A center who can shoot threes and protect the rim, who can guard Jokic, which Harrell – by the way, Harrell's, to your point – is a six seven six eight backup center with a long wingspan, but still trying to guard. I don't know the best post player, high post passer, like seven footer who can shoot three. I mean, that's that's a tough ask. Nikola Jokic is going to work Matres Harrell a lot. That's what's going to happen when you when you invite that matchup. Um, I, I still I, I really like the Clippers. I think Kennard will help them. We'll see if he lives up to that contract from from yesterday. What I, what I'm curious with you is. What's the, what was the most, did you ever have a playoff series defeat that was anything like that? Like what was the most heartbreaking is one thing. Like there are heartbreaking defeats. You lose a game seven, you lose a game five in the first round back when there were game five, like that's heartbreaking. Did you ever have a, a fall from a head playoff loss that left you questioning? Like, how do we move forward from this? Is this going to break us? Is this going to be something that's part of our, you know, in the back of our heads always? Did you ever have anything like that? Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, I think in, uh, 1997, we were up three, one to, uh, Miami ended up losing, um, That's right. when I was with New York. And then in, uh, Houston, we, uh, got up two Oh on, uh, Dallas and, uh, you know, had took the first two on the road and, uh, lost two close home games and the next two. So, um, Yeah. And I think it's not as much like just the losing it's um, what you have to guard against is a loss of belief in it's, you know, you can lose, but you can't lose belief that we can get this right. These are correctable errors. And I think um, for without question, um, you know, LA, the Clippers has to had to do a a harsh introspection player wise, like because you can get away with stuff that yes, you can, should you? So should you as a star player 
sit out practice, even when you're healthy enough to practice? And I think all those questions you have to ask yourself, like, how does it all work? Because it's not just about what's best for you when you're the best player. It's how it impacts the team and the others around you and what you can get done. Because, you know, the one thing that you heard from the Clippers, well, we just didn't have the chemistry. You know, we, we weren't together long enough. And they cited their lack of cohesion. And I would say, but a lot of that was you decided to do that. It wasn't based on circumstances. You decided individually and collectively to shortcut the regular season in many ways and then complain about the, that lack of chemistry and continuity in the playoffs. And I don't think you can do both. I think you, know, you have to invest in the regular season. That doesn't mean you have to play every game and 42 minutes a game. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have to invest in the regular season and acknowledge the importance that the regular season has on the playoffs and that you don't just magically build habits. Habits are built over the course of time. And when you're a team uh, with two new, you know, big time players in Leonard and George, there, there's still work to do. And going back to quoting the great Greg Popovich, you can't skip steps. And I think teams that don't get where they think they should have gotten have to analyze, did we skip steps? Um, in fairness, PG was injured to start the season. I think Paul George and Kawhi played like only 42 games together in the regular season, something like that. But a lot of that was load management and the practice stuff that you mentioned. It's also, it's, it's a tribute to the Raptors culture from 2019 because there was grumbling there about Kawhi missing games and do we know when he's going to miss games or not. And I don't know whether it was Kyle Lowry, Nick Nurse, Masai Ujiri, you know, even younger veterans like Fred Van Vliet, who are just winners and tough guys, like for whatever reason, they were able to absorb that, not let it ruffle feathers, not let it create fissures that lasted and go on and win the title together. And maybe that maybe the Clippers just had too many dynamic elements from the holdover guys who were proud of and justifiably so of building a good team without any stars that won two games against the Warriors in the playoffs in 2018. Uh, maybe there was just too much noise going on. But to your no, point about- or, 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 or let's be fair. Yeah. Good, good fortune. Good luck. You know, the, the ball bounces in. Um, for on, Toronto. Yeah. For Toronto. Yeah. And if that, if that ball bounces out and they lose in overtime, do the grumblings, are they louder? Uh, particularly if Kawhi decides to leave in the finals. What if all the injuries don't happen and they lose? You know, you just don't know. I think sometimes like, Good fortune. You know, like there's never been a championship team in any sport that hasn't benefited from good fortune. I don't care who you are. And I think we have to acknowledge that. And Toronto's championship was uh, like a, a great thing for the NBA and obviously for their organization. And, and this, again, I don't, I don't put all – like when I say this, it's not to be critical of Kawhi Leonard – or, or Paul George, or the Clippers, because that's not the case at all. I'm just saying, I think what you have to do is you have to analyze every one of your actions as a best player and how it impacts the team as a whole. Because every, every best player can, get a, can do what, basically, this idea that you can't do what you want, you can't. I just think you have to ask yourself, but should I? And I think every great player who asks themselves that they have to make the decision that's in the best interest of the team. And I think that's all I'm saying. It, it's not, it's not one way is right. And one way is wrong. It's just, I think the responsibility and the burden of being a great player on a championship level team, that's the burden you have to um, ascend to. And it is different from everyone. I mean, I, I remember, you know, reading, I've read all the books about the 60s Celtics. Like Bill Russell didn't practice a lot. He would sit in the stands and drink tea, I think, if I remember correctly. But, you know, maybe he's earned that right at, at whatever stage of his career. His body needed the rest. It just It's different for every player. But another point that you make is the belief thing is what I'm interested in. Because I really think, not to pick on the Clippers again, but 
I think that 2015 series against the Rockets, when they were up 3-1 and then up 19 late in game six and lost the series, I think that broke that team forever. I, I don't think they ever recovered from it. I don't think the trust and the belief was ever there again. Now, we never got to see it really tested because they were injured every year in the playoffs after that, so it wasn't a fair evaluation. And if you talk to people with the Clippers now, they would say, well, remember, it wasn't just that 2015 series. It was 2014, the year before, the Donald Sterling year, when we melted down in Oklahoma City and had another fall from ahead, disastrous game five and lost a series that we really should have won. Like, remember that last two minutes of that game five were absolutely insane. Uh, all the things that had to happen for them to lose that game. And, and it wasn't just the one year, it was the two that made, if we were, if we were broken, it was the two that broke us, but that one against Denver, I'm just really curious to see what happens when they get punched in the face again. I'm curious to see what happens when they get punched in the face again. And Paul George is one of 10 at halftime. Do they have it in them to dig deep, play together and come back from that? I still think they probably do because mentally you can see them doing the exercise of I can compartmentalize last year from this year. Last year was bubble. That was weird. We had three players with family tragedies that had to leave the bubble. One of them got uh, photographed in a place he wasn't supposed to be. That was strange. Um, It was just weird. We can leave it behind. We can repress the memories of it and move on. We have some new players. That mind trick, maybe it's not a trick. Maybe it's a real thing. I think it can work. I think they have the talent to win the title, but I am curious because you know every great team. I mean, the Lakers were down 1-0 in playoff series, like multiple playoff series. Every great team is going to have a moment where they get punched, and the Clippers got punched, and when they got punched, they fell over and rolled out of the ring like an unconscious boxer and decided to pack it in. Yeah. I, I'm going to say that, though, the 3 3-1- 1 you know, when you get people come back 3-1, if that was a normal year, I got to say, I'm not sure they're losing, you know, two home games and a road game. Exactly. Right? So, like, I just think the bubble experience is the bubble experience. And I think the the big thing for, like, a, for the Clippers as a whole, I like their roster renovations because you have to have guys on your roster – that believe in your best players and tolerate some um, quirks or, you know, things that could get in the way, particularly if you've had good success, which the Clippers had good success for their talent level the year before George and Leonard came. So I, I like the roster renovations because you have to have guys who aren't trying to nitpick like at a Paul George on your own team, you got to have that be the media. Now that doesn't mean that Paul George should be above being coached, corrected, um, challenged, all those things, right. That happen within a team, but there also has to be a belief that, Hey, we are so fortunate to have this guy. This guy's a big time player. Like I hope Paul George hasn't forgotten. He's a great player. Like he is a great defender, he can shoot it. He can put it on the floor. Like, and I don't think he's in competition with Kawhi Leonard, which is a great sign for their team. So I think he and Leonard just have to make it abundantly clear that they understand their responsibilities. And then the players that are playing with them have to believe as a group, man, we are so fortunate that we have these guys because we have a real shot to win it all. And, you know, I think renovating your roster helps with that. It cleanses your, your team's palate to have that belief. Now, the flip side is, you mentioned 3-1, is Denver. I have Denver in the inner circle of legitimate challengers to the Lakers or whatever you want to call it with Milwaukee, Brooklyn, uh, Miami. We can talk about Miami if you want, and the Clippers. Um, and then I have Utah. A, a one tier below that. By the way, no great insult to the Jazz. I think the Jazz are awesome. I just am a little more, I just need to see a little more than what Denver showed me coming back from 3 1 twice in, in the bubble. I feel like you, uh, I, I don't know where you are on Denver, but I know you're higher on Utah than me, which maybe means you're lower on Denver to me. Do you not see any separation between those teams? Are they all in the same tier to you? 
Yeah, I, 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 I love Utah. I, I think what Utah, you know, again, they, they were up 3-1. And, you know, hey, Murray and Jokic are the real deal. Like, they, they got beat. And, um, but I think Bogdanovich's injury, you know, sort of became overlooked once they went up 3-1. Uh, and I think favors coming back is, uh, a, you know, a great uh, piece to add back to Utah. And I think Mike Conley, you know, he had an up and down year and played better against Denver. And if he's really good again, I, I think they should be in that Denver tier. And Denver, uh, you know, they lost some good depth, um, I'm so interested. Uh, the, the one guy I can't wait to watch this year is Compazzo. Because oh, baby. Oh, baby. Because, Bring me all the Compazzo highlights. Listen, we, when I was with USA Basketball, we played against him. And I was in a tournament in Argentina, Cordoba, Argentina, where he was in the room right across from me. He is the dirtiest, <laughs> nastiest competitor on, like – that you could ever have. And he is absolutely, do I want him on my team? Absolutely. He is tiny. There are things that are going to get in the way, but I'm going to tell you the thing I love about Sergio Hernandez, I, I, if it, like everybody should watch the Argentinian national team. If you love beautiful basketball, that guy's an, a phenomenal coach, but the way they allow their, their guards to play with both, they're both, they play with flair, but also fundamentally. I think Campazzo, to me, um, he's the guy I want to watch. He should already be placed in the rookie. Uh, what are they called? They're not having that this there, year. We don't have it. We don't have it. The, uh, the, the, right, well, the, the, the Poulin Weed Eater Taco Bell Sprite Rookie Sophomore Challenge. Yeah. Could we have that on an outdoor court then? In like, Let's do it. Like some city so we can watch him? Because I, I love this guy um, as a competitor. Now, I don't know how he's actually going to play. Um but that's my most interesting man in the NBA this year. I thought you were going to say he kept his room dirty as well as being a dirty player no, when no. you said you were across the hall from no. him. No, listen, when you're in these tournaments, right, you're, we all four teams, all four teams were in the same hotel. You ate in the same, uh, you know, ballroom. And so the first day, like we didn't play them until the finals, but in the first day, you know, we're there like five days you know, I'd, I'd make eye contact with him and, and he'd make eye contact with me and we'd, you know, give a greeting. By the time it got to the final, this is what I love about him. The guy we cut, we would be walking down the hallway. He wouldn't even look at me. He'd be like staring right through me. I, I, this guy is fierce. And, you know, I don't know if you can say a prick on this. So, you know, you can. Yeah, like, of course he, you can. What are you talking he about? He's an absolute prick. Like he's going to start in every game. Like every game, he's going to start something. He's going to – that's his nature. That's how he's become such an outstanding player. But his passing ability, like this guy will come off a pick and roll, nutmeg the five man, catch it on the run, and whip a behind-the-back pass to the weak side corner. And, like, I mean, he sees things, and he's been allowed to play with that flair his entire life. This is – he can be fundamental and – play with this dramatic flair that I think gets squelched by so many coach. I don't smoke. I've actually never smoked. I've taken one drag of a cigarette in my whole life. And it was part of a bet for a girl who still doesn't know that this happened. So this is re being revealed on a podcast. Is that, that's it. But what you just described it, there are going to be multiple Jokic Campazzo highlights this year where I'm going to watch them. And I'm just going to have to leave my house and walk around and smoke a cigarette. It sounds like I just, I can't, I, I'm just not going to be able to function for a little while after like, if they combine on a pass pass highlight, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, a little, I'm a, I'm a little bit, I'm getting, getting hot under the collar right now. I'm actually surprised that Jokic hasn't tried to take him out in practice because, you know, they beat Argentina beat Serbia last year uh, in the world cup. Like it was like the, what, if it happened in like the Olympics, people would be talking about it as one of the great upsets, you know, that we've had. I mean, and they riddled them. And Compazzo was like, like he was, I was at the game scouting it. Uh, and 
he was he was phenomenal. And he, and I'll be but the thing I'm going to be interested is can he adapt and adjust to playing a lesser role? Like it's not easy when you've always been the guy. Well, think about what we've seen. Juan Carlos Navarro couldn't make the adjustment. Milos Teodosic was here for a second, one of the greatest passers in the history of the world, and couldn't stick in the NBA. It's hard. It is, but the one thing I would say is, even at his size, Campazzo is a nasty defender. Like he's gonna, he's got great anticipation. You put the ball down. He he understands when to attack the ball. He's hard to screen on the pick and roll. Now you can shoot over him, no, no question. But different from those two guys, he'll be in a fist fight before he gets embarrassed. He, he truly is an elite competitor. I'm really, really high on Denver. I think the loss of Jeremy Grant matters, but I think it's being overplayed because he looks like he looks like the guy who can guard Kawhi Leonard and LeBron James. And, and in comparison to the rest of Denver's roster, he was, as well as Torrey Craig, although bigger guys can bowl over Torrey Craig a little bit, he was their best option. And he's gone. I get that. I like Jermichael Green um, and as, as a replacement. You know, Will Barton, speaking of absences that were overlooked, Will Barton, his absence was very overlooked. Gary Harris, I think, is going to have a bounce back year. Like, they have it. They have... They don't have the apex predator wing defender. Like nobody has those guys. There's nobody that can guard LeBron James, Andre Iguodala, Kevin Durant. Like those guys have done the done the best job of it, and they're freaks. You can't find those guys. I think Denver is going to be awesome, and I am. That you know, there's been a lot of rumors, and I think they're true that um, Houston in the heart and stuff is is targeting, I think they're targeting more players than teams. And one of the players that's on their list to target is Michael Porter Jr. I am rooting against that because I think, look, Porter defensively has a long way to go. I have, I will say he looked increasingly not lost as the playoffs went on. Like once the midpoint of that Utah series passed, he looked not as out of place. He was in generally somewhat the right place at the right time. And we've seen a guy like DeAndre Ayton came in his first year, had no idea what was going on. He's already a solid defender for a big man. Like you can make, you can go from lost to not lost with experience. And I just think Murray Jokic Porter has a chance to be so special on offense as three guys, different positions, different skill sets, all complement each other that I'm rooting for that versus anything else. I want to see Michael Porter Jr. stay on the Nuggets and and find a way to coexist with those two guys offensively because to me, point guard, center, wing, wing who can slide to the four, I, I just don't know what you do against those three offensively. Now, they have some questions to answer defensively. I think the questions are, I, I, people are looking at them as this like clueless bottom 10 defense. I don't think they're going to be that. I think they have the chance to be the best offense in the NBA. And why I like them over Utah, and I'm interested to hear your take on this. And look, these are little teensy, teensy gaps. Is you said it right from the beginning. Murray and Jokic, holy cow. Two guys who in the playoffs, when everything slows down, when a top five defense is strangling everything you've got, can say, give me the ball, and I'm going to make something happen. To have two of those guys is almost like a prerequisite for winning the title. Utah's got one. Donovan Mitchell, and he's spectacular. Oh, my God, was he amazing in that series. I'm not sure they have two, but to your point, maybe Conley picking up where he left off before the season was suspended. Bogdanovich, 20-point scorer, does a little bit of everything. And Utah's general sort of flowing offense, maybe that all coalesces to like be that second guy. But I just like the idea of those two guys – They've proven it. Murray has proven it. Jokic has proven it. They are monstrous in the playoffs, and I trust them when, when the game slows down. Well, I agree with you. I agree with you about how good they are. Did you, were we all saying the same thing down 3-1 in the opening series? Were we saying the same exact thing? See, what happens so often, and rightfully so to some extent, the results change our frame of reference. So if that was three out of five series, we'd be having the same questions 
about Denver that we're saying about Utah. It goes four out of seven. Great comeback. Great comeback against uh, the Clippers. And there they are in the Western Conference Finals and uh, acquitted, acquitted themselves well there. I, I think Denver is really good. Um, I think offensively, with the passing of Jokic and the two-man actions, the spontaneous two-man actions too, not that you have to call something every time down. Those two, Jokic and Murray, can get into actions that help each other. I think Porter is going to be more of a four um, in their finishing group. Um, and it'll be interesting to me if that's true. Can Gary Harris make enough shots? Um, can Will Barton accept a role um, that may not be exactly what he wants? Um, and, you know, do you play another point guard? Does Compazzo or Monte Morris – uh, give you a better chance to win, or do you go a little bit bigger? I think Denver, though, you're right. They're going to be there. They're really good. But I love Utah as well. To be clear, I have Denver probably third in the West behind the L.A. teams in terms of, like, chances to win the championship. But I think they're pretty close to the Clippers, maybe a little bit behind the Clippers. And then I have got kind of Utah, Dallas, Portland um, all together. Houston. Like, oh yeah, you're you're what? super. So Houston was one of the teams we disagreed on. So give it to me. I but no, like I don't can, what happened? Like they what happened? Their best player wants to get traded. Yeah, but if they have him, which I think is more likely than not, at least to start the year, if you can only judge by what is happening now, why would anyone think they're going to drop from what were they a four seed last year or five? One of the two. I don't know. Some seed. They're all, it's all, it's all. And then they're up one Oh against the Lakers. And then all of a sudden the Lakers play great and, and take the next four that they're not good enough to be. Well, the the Lakers played great. And then like other, other stuff happened. Like Houston played like poo poo and laid down and like forgot how to play defense for four straight games or three straight games toward the end anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, game three was close, right? They, they were in a game two and three, both of them. Yeah. So here's the thing. Like, again, I think Houston is being judged harshly. Like I, I don't know like about how the wall trade and Westbrook trade. I thought Westbrook was the clear winner in that trade. He got to get the ball back in his hands. He got to play for a coach he's previously played for. So to me, Westbrook was the clear winner, but I think both teams are going to benefit from a change of scenery from both those guys. And if Harden, you know, is there, I think he's going to play well. Um, I think they actually, in many ways, you could say they have a better roster this year than they had last year. I think Eric Gordon, who I really like, is going to bounce back and shoot the ball better and play better offensively. And so I think they're actually, they have a chance to be better than they were last year if Harden stays. And so I, I, I don't really understand. I, some people have them out of the playoffs. And I'm like, really? Well, first the West is good. I have them in really my play. I, I have them in my play in tier just because I, I just listed five teams already that I have ahead of them. All those teams I think are really, really good. And Phoenix, I think, or maybe I listed six teams. Phoenix is, I think, going to be really good. And I just like, I don't know. I've never worked for an NBA team. I've never played for an NBA team. I just can't imagine when the well is poisoned to this degree, you can all get back together and say, you know what? All for one, one for all. Oh God, John Wall's on my team. He hasn't played in two years. Like, let's let's really band together. And I'm just, I guess, I'm just kind of betting that they will trade him at some point. In which case, I just I, they're gone. But to your point, look, PJ Tucker's still here. By the way, he's unhappy too about his contract extension. Christian Wood is the most versatile offensive big man that Harden has ever played with as as a screen setter. I, that that pick and roll combination is going to be absolutely lethal. So yeah, they do have they. They, if they get anything out of Cousins, that's a bonus. They do have an upside. I just, I just sort of look at them like, oh, I don't know, whatever. Just, we'll see what happens, I guess. Yeah, and and you know, where if they're holding out for what you know the papers or the media reports say they're holding out for, who can pro possibly give them all of that? Like, I don't, and, and still that team that gives all that still be in position to win it. So. I'm interested, but I think they're being vastly overrated. And I think 
Underrated. Uh, underrated. I mean, underrated. Yeah. And I think vastly, uh, I think the amount of dysfunction there uh, may be a lot. I'm not really sure, but I think it's being underrated in other cities. Like well, well, there's dysfunction in most every situation. Like, like tell me a team that's truly happy. Like, you know, PJ Tucker's upset, right? Like, okay. There's a lot of guys that think they should be paid more. Does that mean he's not going to compete hard? I don't think so. Yeah, I, I think, look, I, I, you just mentioned Will Barton. Will Barton's been very open about, I'm a starter. I don't want to come off the bench. I'm not interested in it. Like, I think Denver is, has very quietly navigated a lot of those tensions, and they've done it well. But the earlier point you made about the Clippers and results, I think it's a failing in the media sometimes that like the, the, the bad stuff only comes out after, after the fact, after you lose, after a player's demanded a trade, after a player's already out the door and plays for another team, all of a sudden we hear about what a, what a cancer they were and how dysfunctional it was like, well, where was that when you were winning 65 games? You know, Amen. like a lot of that was still there. Amen. Amen. And the anonymous sources that, that, that crush people, Coaches, players, management people, um, it's easy. It's every, and it's everybody. It's not like to your point, it's not just executives and it's no, everybody no. across the board. It's, it's it, and it's, a, it's a easy to me. It's also, if you're, if you're not careful, it can devolve into cheap shots. Um, and when a person after the fact, I don't care who it is. I think as a media person, you have to be very leery of someone that would point the finger anonymously at somebody else on the way out the door. It would make me as a media person want to question that guy. What's his role in it all? Like if you're going to bury somebody on the way out and you're not going to attach your name to it, let me analyze what his role was in that demise of the team or whatever. So I agree with you. Um, and I think it's happened, you know, with, you know, a lot of teams, a lot of people. And, and, and frankly, you know, like, you know, I'm more sensitive when it happens to coaches, but like you said, it's not just coaches at all. Um, speaking of hard and trade destinations, can the net, can the Nets win the championship? Do you believe the Nets belong in that inner circle? Absolutely. They can win the championship. I, I again, I didn't see Durant in the preseason, um, I'm just so interested in the sage that that Kyrie Irving. I I was so distracted by watching the highlights of Kyrie Irving walking around the court court with that sage in his hands that I forgot to watch the highlights of that game. Um, but when you look at their talent, how can you how could we possibly come to the conclusion if Durant and Irving are healthy, both physically and mentally, they're into it. How could we think that they're not good enough? Durant's already been the best player on a championship team. Kyrie Irving's already been the second best player on a championship team. And then the depth that the Nets have, if they have enough shooting around those guys, I, I, I really like them. I, I don't know how you couldn't like them. They're in my inner circle. I think the Nets are going to be awesome. I think in the, in the focus on the soap opera and the Instagram live and this and that people are just overlooking this team's awesome. And now, and less so now that Durant has played and people have seen him and said, Oh, he looks, looks like Kevin Durant who last we saw him was a two time finals MVP who was coming for LeBron's throne as the best player in the world. Um, and I in- love Steve Nash too. I, I love like, Again, I don't I know how they're working it there. I'm not, I'm not privy to all that, but I think he was one of the great teammates, besides being a great player, one of the great teammates of all time. And he has a way with people that he can help unify. And I think the biggest job there is to make sure that the best players stay together, that the um, players that had bigger roles last year um, stay very much appreciated by both the best players and by the organization. And I think Steve Nash is the, is a great guy to do that. I just think he has a great uh, IQ for people 
situations. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it was an inspired choice. Well, in a lot of ways, they're living year one of what the Clippers lived last year, two new guys and some holdover guys who are proud of what they've accomplished in bigger roles, except Kevin and Kyrie were around and on the team last season and Kyrie played a chunk of a chunk of that season. But to your point, the, the challenge for the coach and the, and the chemistry is the same, but I'm, I'm super high on the nets. I do think they're a legitimate championship contender. Two more quick ones. Where are you on the golden state warriors? I think Steph Curry could be the MVP. I think his opportunities uh, because of the ball being in his hands all the time, not having to share it with, you know, Clay and Durant. I think he's going to put up huge, huge numbers. I'd be surprised if they weren't at least in the play in to, to the lower tier of playoff teams. I have them in, in the play in, I have them like in the seven to nine range in the West, just cause I'm worried about the lack of shooting, um, around Steph and some of the depth, but he, he is, he is that good. And I do like, you know, unlike a year ago when they were trying to kind of figure it out on the fly and in the roster, you know, they're starting D'Angelo and Steph and Glenn Robinson and Draymond, et cetera. I, I think this team has an identity that was already made for them that they can lean into. And Steve Kerr has talked about it right off the bat, which is just length, speed, chaos, transition. It's just so much easier when you have, when you're not trying to figure out what you are as a team for the first 20 games. And I don't think, I think last year they were going to have to go through that process before Steph broke his hand and it was not going well. They were one and three and getting destroyed. Um, and this year they don't. This year I think they enter the season. Yeah, they got to work out some pieces. We haven't seen Wiseman yet. We haven't seen Draymond in preseason, blah, blah, blah. I think they know who they are. Uh, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not much higher on them than, you know, play in maybe sixth or something if, if things go right, fifth or sixth if things really go right. Um, Last one. Is there an under the radar team, maybe not even a playoff team, maybe a for sure lottery team that for whatever reason, you're really excited to watch um, either stylistically or just what, for whatever reason. That's a good question. A lottery team. I, I tell you, I think, you know, Sacramento is to me always interesting. These teams that have had these long, long playoff droughts, who is the person or what is the change that's going to elevate a team? And, you know, I think Dave Yeager had, when he was there, he had a start to a plan to play as fast as any team in the league. And they were going to, you know, they maybe weren't good at certain things, but they were in great shape and they were going to, use Fox's speed and the rest of the team, right? Spacing and let De'Aaron run. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, now what's going to do it? Like what's going to change it up? You know, like, is it new management in, in Monte? Moore? Is it, is it, you know, clearing out some of the clutter, like, so that guys feel more at home in their roles by letting Bogdanovich go and, letting heel to send back into a starting role? Um, is it an emphasis on some other phase of the game? Like, I think it's 14 years, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that they haven't been the playoffs. And whatever it is, it's long. It might be longer. It might be longer than that, actually. Yeah. I mean, and they, back in the early 2000s, they had it roll in there, great home court advantage, great players. Like, so what is going to give them a chance to elevate in a very powerful Western conference. So I, that, I'm, I'm interested in Sacramento. It is 14 years. I'm interested in them too. Um, you know, stylistically, again, they, I agree with you. At the end of that 2019 season, particularly in like February, March, they look like, all right, we're, we're onto something. We got some homegrown talent that blends pretty well together. We're figuring out how to play together. Fox looks like a future star. Last year, I think injuries made injuries, plus new coaching and just general Kingsy chaos made it hard for them to land on something. Um, I'm bullish on Fox. I really want to see Bagley this year. And, and I don't think they're a playoff team, but, but they have the upside of, Hey, we could get frisky and be in the play in the team I'm interested in just endlessly is the Spurs because it just feels like they've hit the moment of transition in a lot of different ways. It kind of felt like that last year, DeRozan and Aldridge are still here on expiring contracts in the bubble Aldridge didn't play. And all of a sudden the Spurs unleashed 
their marauding band of young wings, Derek White, DeJounte Murray, finally playing together, Lonnie Walker, the fourth running all over the place, Keldon Johnson just smashing stuff. They played at the fastest pace in the league for the season. If you isolated the bubble, their pace would have been number one for the season. Totally different team attacking the rim. And now LaMarcus and DeMar are back. Good players, by the way. People, and I, I'm guilty of it too, they're, they're old-fashioned players. Maybe they don't get you to win at the very highest level, but they're good. Like they're good players. Your floor is only so low with those guys on your team. They're still good, um, but stylistically very different from how they were in the bubble. Um, people like the Vassal kid that they just drafted another wing. I'm just interested to see how Pop melds all of that together because in there somewhere is a team that can get into the play-in tournament and be a pain in the butt. And another version of it is they never really meld successfully and you play one way sometimes and people are frustrated and then you play another way sometimes and other people are frustrated and it just sort of peters out. Um, I, I don't know. What do you see there? Well, I love Derek White and I was so happy to see his contract for him. I just, that's such a great story. Um, and I think they, again, played very well offensively in the bubble. I think their challenges are going to be defensively and you know, the whole point five mentality that Greg Popovich has preached um, in the bubble, I, I think they found their magic, you know, and yet, you know, the Rudy Gay, DeRozan, Aldridge, you know, they play differently, you know, and that's not a bad thing. Like you said, like being a really good player in the NBA is not a bad thing. It's like, it's hard to be really good. And but how do you transition? You know, um, I think the Spurs, the thing that I've always admired about them is they had a bedrock always since uh, Pop has been there of character and defense and unselfish offense. And they've played differently offensively um, through his course of time. But I've always admired how Robinson gracefully then turned it over to Duncan, how Duncan did that with Parker and Ginobili. And now we're to this other point of, you know, Aldridge and DeRozan. Can they gracefully still be effective players, really effective players, while grasping that this is a year of transition and that they're going to have to share, play differently as Aldridge did last year, shooting threes, but also just moving the ball at a quicker rate. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated because I think – uh, Pop is excited about um, where they're heading. And uh, transition sometimes is good for everybody. And it can be exciting for everybody. And hopefully this is a year that the San Antonio fan, even though they may not win big, they can embrace uh, the transition. Well, and, and also to your point, DeMar did play in the bubble. He was there. He was part of the go-go Spurs. And you look at some of his numbers, you know, 10 assists, seven assists, eight assists, five assists. Like he's a good passer. Never been a great passer, but he's a good and willing passer. And exactly Aldridge deciding in the middle of last year, okay, time for me to look at this line on the floor and shoot from behind it because I get an extra point. If he becomes a catch and shoot guy who spaces the floor, that's room. That's all connected with how you turn more of the offense over to these dribble drive guys because he becomes a catch and shoot threat who's not in the way anymore. How willing is he to play that role? instead of give me my 20 touches a game on the left block. Well, last year was, I think, a positive step in that direction. Yeah, and DeRozan, maybe he's a four-man now. Like, maybe you just play four smalls and, and one big. And, you know, Pirtle's okay, and, you know, they, they've got guys. Um, and, again, it's not necessarily – when you say you have them in a play on, play-in game, it's not denigrating San no. Antonio. It's acknowledging how good the other teams are. And I think – that's what gets lost in all of this. The Western Conference, there's only one team, Oklahoma City, that's not playing to be a playoff team this year. And that's it. And everybody else, the other 14, think they should be in the playoffs or at the very least be in the play-in. We can all agree, by the way, making the play-in but not making the top eight, not getting into the playoffs – you don't get to say we made the playoffs this year, right? Is it? Can we all agree on that unanimously? Yes. You don't get to see, yeah, that's unanimous. I keep seeing like, does that count as a play? No, you have to no. get into the playoffs. 
No, the playoffs are the playoffs. And, and listen, I was as adamant against the play-in game. I'm sure I'm, I'm still not sold on it, but I did love it for the bubble. I'm just not sold on it necessarily for when we get back to normal basketball like this year. You know, like should – if I'm one game better – than a team through 72 games. Should I have to prove it again? Uh, you know, but maybe it's great. I, it was great in the bubble. I, I thought it, it led to more inspired play in the bubble. Um, so uh, I'm interested to see how the whole play in thing works, but a play in, you're not in the playoffs no. until you qualify for the playoffs. This should be like written in stone in the NBA, you know, commandments. Except, except. Uh oh. If you're an eighth or seventh seed that gets upset, then I'm giving you the playoff berth because you earned it. And no. Yes, we can't, we can't start building an exception yes, to this. You're in or you're out. Everything's an exception in life. Uh, this is horrible. What a no, horrible way because, to end this podcast. No, because you earned it. It was stolen by some made up tournament that benefits a team that stinks comparatively to you. I feel like Marty Jannetty and Shawn Michaels just kicked me through a glass window out of nowhere. This is, no. this is a turn for the worse. If you're the ninth or 10th seed, you're not in the playoffs unless you qualify for the playoffs. But if you're a seventh or eighth seed that somehow get upset in the play-in, you're still a playoff team. That's my rule. Wow. This is really taking a turn. All right. Well, you said a phrase uh, a second ago that, that stuck me, and you said, now that we're back to normal basketball, boy – I hope that's true. I don't feel like it's true, but I know what you mean. I know what you mean. We're back to a regular no, season. We're, we're not, not in a bubble. Yeah. We're not. But I just want to conclude by saying, you know, hovering, we're having a fun basketball conversation. Please, everyone who's traveling around, everybody in the NBA, everyone who's traveling around, period, don't, if you don't have to, but be safe. Please take care of yourselves. I'm going to cross everything I have and knock on all the wood in my house that we get through this NBA season safe and healthy. And that includes you, Coach, because you're going to be traveling here and there too. So let's let's remember what is actually important. And um, as always, you know, your insight is second to none. And I appreciate you coming on. Happy holidays. Coach.